pastor asked me to speak, I didn't know that they were both going to be here today. <laughs> they were at a workers meeting and weren't going to have time to prepare and I didn't know they'd be back. So this is, this is unique for me having the pastor here when I'm actually speaking, you know. <laughs> you saw the title in the bulletin, Do You Love Me? So I guess you can't guess what the subject's going to be this morning, can you? What is your view of God? Did you really think about that? And why should he occupy a higher priority in your life? What is he going to need to displace in your life in order to take his proper position in your life? Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, your weak and frail vessel kneels before you this morning knowing that he can do nothing without you. So I appeal to you to pour out your Holy Spirit at this time, not just on me, but on this sanctuary. Let the hearers receive exactly what you have for each and one, every one of them. This I pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> what is my view of God? Now this is a very subjective question because as we go through life, that view changes. And it all depends on things like our upbringing, our experiences, people that we've interfaced with, people that have encouraged us, many things come into play here. Now, for our purpose this morning in this presentation, since we're in a church, I'm going to assume that each and every one within my hearing believes that there is a God. However, believing is not enough. Because as James 2 verse 19 tells us, that the devils also believe and tremble. Now why would the, the uh, devils tremble? Because they know when the judgment comes, they are going to be under condemnation. I believe that most of the world out there should be trembling today because we know we're getting close to the Lord's return. But the reason they don't tremble is because they are in ignorance. For if they knew what was in this book, their lives would either be changed or they would be in fear of that judgment time. What do the history books of the Old Testament tell us? They tell us things like how God loves us and cares for us and the guidance he gives us for our lives. And in there we see a repeated pattern because God expects things from us. If we go back to Genesis chapter 3, the first seven verses, we see that God gave Adam and Eve a test. Now, was it a difficult test? No. They had all the trees of the garden to eat from. They weren't hungry, and yet they failed to be obedient to him. They failed that test. Go on years later, when the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt and God pulled them out of there. At the foot of Mount Sinai, they received the Ten Commandments. And we know that those are in Exodus 20, 1 through 17. Now look at a, look at a verse with me, Micah. Now, Micah is about the sixth book from the back of the Old Testament. Micah 6, verse 8. It says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, 
love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. So in these three places in Scripture, we see that God does test us, He gives us commandments, and He also has requirements for us. And I believe as we finish off the message this morning, we'll see that those requirements are still there. If we go back and study the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, we see that the, his people would get off track. And every time they'd get off track, they'd turn back to him, and he would lovingly bring them back again. So if that was the repeated case, why didn't they just continue to follow him? May I suggest that they couldn't because there was one piece of the equation that was missing. Remember what they said at the foot of Mount Sinai. Whatever he says, what? We will do. They were following him on their own power. The thing that was missing was love. So we're going to take a look at some things this morning and see what comes into play here. Because we know that a new covenant was called about. Turn to Jeremiah with me, if you will. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. And we're going to start at verse 31. Now remember, he had given them tests, he had given them commandments, and he had requirements of them. So let's look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it where? In their hearts. And that's where it has to be. He finishes off the verse and will be their God and they shall be what? His people. Whoever has these things written in their hearts will be his people. Was there a change in the laws brought out in the new covenant? No. Was there a change in any requirements? No. The only thing that was added was love. And that's going to be my subject this morning. You know, uh, I apologize to some of the young people this morning because I'm going to bring up a musical movie that was put out in about 1964. So many of you wouldn't be familiar with this. But it was called Fiddler on the Roof. And it was about a poor Russian milkman, his wife, and five daughters. It took place in Russia around 1905. And it centered around the fact that his eldest daughter was going to be married. The town butcher is the one that wanted to marry her. And this would have set up the family very well, you know, in these little poor towns like that. That butcher, man, he's, he's good for the money. She'd be set. But there was only one problem. This young woman loved the tailor. And the tailor didn't make a lot of money. But in that movie, Golda, who was Tevye's wife, asks Tevye a question. She says, do you love me? And how do you think Tevye answered? He said, look at what I do for you. Look at the house that I've provided. 
the food for your stomachs, the clothing we wear. And Golde said, oh yes, you are a good provider, but do you love me? That's the question, isn't it? That's the question God is asking us. Do you love me? Now, the reason I bring this up is because we can go through church our whole lives. We can attempt to keep his commandments, do charitable work, and still come up short of the goal. Why? Because we do not love him. We need to fall in love with him. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. And the very first verse in 1 Corinthians 13 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, which is agape love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I'm just a noisemaker. So it doesn't matter what I do, if I don't do it with love, it's not worth anything. So let's take a few minutes this morning and contemplate this thing called love, because we know of its importance. And Satan has done and is doing everything in his power to pervert our understanding of love. We hear that word applied so many times in different situations. Apple pie, hot dogs, baseball, you know, people love all sorts of things, but we're going to just shove those out of the way as non-personal. And we're going to look at the things that are pertinent to our subject, and that is interpersonal relationships. I hear girls and some women talking about uh, loving some actor or a musician or other personality. And if this person is going to be entertaining or in the area, they aren't going to miss it for the world. I mean, we've all seen these situations. I, mean, I can remember years ago, phenomenon with rock stars and these girls screaming to the top of their lungs and they, they, they had to be around them. And guys, you're not exempt from this. You may take it in a different way. You may have all these sports figures that you look up to and you love them. So much so that you'll study their statistics and you'll watch every game that they're on. And matter of fact, I just saw the other day that there's a, a magazine out called Fantasy Football. I mean, we get wrapped up in things. And these are the things that so many call love. But I believe that that's just a trap of Satan's to take us away from God and get us to spend time doing other things than what we should be doing. Satan is so good at trying to divert our attention. Perhaps we would do well if we would create a little diary of our time or just chart it out. Keep track for a week or a month of where you spend your time. How much of your day do you designate for the Lord? Have you ever thought about it? I've met people that can't take time five minutes a day. I know I've taught Sabbath school for years and in most of my classes I had students that didn't even take time to read the page on the quarterly. Now if you can't even do that, God asks you, do you love me? Why don't I love God needs to be our question. There can be many reasons, and I'll attempt to touch on a few of them this morning. The f first one I see that we'll address is, I don't see the need. And say, how can that be? 
We're all here in church. How can you be in church and not see the need? And that's because many people that are in church are here, you fill in the blank, to make someone happy. Now, that can be a parent, it can be a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, it can be a spouse, it can be a grandparent. Why are you here? You may not see the need other than just to make them happy. Another one we are going to address is, what has he done for me? Those that ask these questions, we often hear them following a natural disaster and they ask questions like, where was God when this happened? We heard a lot of that around 9-11 and around uh, the time of Hurricane Katrina and other events like that. They think that God should be just there to do what they want. Number three is, I don't believe all of this is necessary. You know, they've heard people say, well, the law was nailed to the cross and we're saved by grace only, so we don't need to be loving and obedient. All we have to do is take Jesus as our Savior. Well, we've got to break down some of these blockades, either in others or in our own minds because we might be a, among that group. The first blockade is I don't see the need group. Well, a lot of times that group is, is not following God's word. They don't believe it's important. Oh, mom, mom believes that, or dad believes that, or Uncle Jake believes that, but I don't believe all that stuff. That's just a book, after all. So how do we break down that blockade? 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us how much scripture is given by inspiration of God? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. What good is it? It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now all scripture, what he's referring to was where? The Old Testament. None of the New Testament had been written yet. And yet we see denominations today wanting to throw out the whole Old Testament. But that's exactly what he points to. We also see in, in the Old Testament, history, history of God's people. Why do we study history? So that we won't make the same mistakes that they made. So if they aren't in God's word, they're gonna make these mistakes. Well, the, this, this person that says, I don't see the need, says, well, you just read me a verse of some other words in here. It doesn't mean anything. So how do we break down that blockade? I've had people in this church ask me that very question. And what I do to start with is take them to the book of Daniel. 600 years before Christ, Daniel laid out the history of the world that's true to this day. When it got down to the, the ten toes made of iron and clay, said they won't cling to each other. Look at Europe today. It's getting ready to fall apart. Britain is pulling out. Germany is afraid of that happening because there are other countries where the majority of the people don't want to be in the European Union anymore. Iron and clay, it can't adhere. Prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes. And when you can show people that, and you say, that came from this book over 2,600 years ago, then you have a chance to start showing them prophecies that go along with the history of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. 
so we can break down that wall with them Now, I said that in 2 Timothy 3.16 that there was four things he brought out there. Why do you think he gave us that profitability list? Because all those things are profitable for us, aren't they? He gave us that list, so look at verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If we follow these things, he will make us into a complete Christian. Now, if we can break that down, we can begin to show them the reasons that we should love God. Let's go to our scripture this morning, Ephesians chapter 2. Did you listen closely as they were reading those verses this morning? Ephesians 2 verse 4 said, But God who is rich in, what? Mercy. Praise the Lord that he's a merciful God. For his great, what? Love. Wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Now there are many people you're going to run into in the world that consider themselves pretty good. You know, God will accept me because I don't try to do anything against anybody. They think they can make it that way. But can they make it that way? Romans 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. So if all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages for that sin is death, what good is pretty good? Doesn't mean anything, does it? Every man, woman, and child is under the death penalty. Doesn't matter how good they think they are. Let's continue in Ephesians 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Are you looking forward to that day? Can you imagine that day? I knew an elder back in Phoenix that said he'd be happy just to sneak in the back door of heaven. Is that what Jesus is telling us here? Heavens, no. I want to sit with you. I want to be there together with you in heavenly places. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And he wants me to sit with him. I'm not worthy of that. Doesn't matter. It's something he's offering. Verse 7, that in ages to come he might show exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Is that grace rich, richly offered? I say it is. And it is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. We know those verses fill, finish out. So the God of creation that made you, sustains you, he was holy in and of himself, is still willing not only to provide for our salvation, but to have us, of all things, sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Praise God. Does a love like that for you now elicit a love for him in return? Does this not answer the question, what has he done for me? If that's not enough, let's just think of some of our blessings. 
You know, I try to ask people in some of the studies I have or in Sabbath school classes, do you have any blessings today? And it's so often it's just into blank stares. But I like to praise God just for my senses. I may have to wear glasses, but I praise the Lord that I can see all the vibrant colors he's provided for me out there. I can see the beauty that's still in this world even though it's paled due to its sinfulness. I praise God for my hearing because I can hear the birds chirp. I can hear the music that these composers that he has inspired to write gorgeous music to. I can hear that. And I can also do what you're doing this morning, hear the spoken word of God. Amen. I praise God for my sense of smell. You know, there's a lot of times I'll be preparing breakfast and cutting a piece of fruit and the smell of it hits my nose and I start to salivate. Because why? Because he provides things, not only for the tantalization of my nostrils, but also, my, oops, excuse me, my taste buds. Just think of all the things he's brought forth from the earth, not only for our nourishment, but our healing and strength. And it's not just one taste, such a variety. What blessing we have in our smell and our taste. And then the last one is the touch of feel, where we have the opportunity to touch others and draw close to them. Or of newborn babies, their little feet are so soft. Praise God for these senses. He gives us so much. And not only that, but we think about these things and we think about these bodies that he has given us that are fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, I'm in the golden years of my life, let's say, and I still praise him for the health that I enjoy. It just amazes me. And the fact that I have four limbs that work because there are some that are not that fortunate. I praise him for all the things that he does for me. The fact that my mind still functions properly is one of the things I praise him for. Now, would I do that if Satan had his way? No, because in Genesis 6 verse 5, Talking about the antediluvians, it says, Every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So every good thought I have is from my Lord and Savior. Now, I could go on with praises, but I need to move along. I got a little late start here this morning because all the blessings we had up here. So I will try to get through this as rapidly as possible. Let's, uh, let's go on to the item where God was in the disaster. We need to remind people when they say, where was God, that the insurance companies aren't right. God was there. He allows things to happen in the world today, just like he allowed things to happen to ancient Israel when they weren't walking in harmony with him. But he was there. But he wasn't the cause of it. Satan is the cause of it. And I wonder what their response would be, those people that question God, if they were asked, what have they done recently to honor him? That they would want to be, have him be the desire of their lives. And I dare say the majority of them wouldn't have an answer for that because they expect him to be their magic genie. Let's think of the life of Jesus a little bit here. If we looked at Revelation 21, and because of time I'm not going to go there, verses 11 through 25 tell us of the New Jerusalem. 
and you all know it, the New Jerusalem as it comes down, you measure it and it's larger than the state of Colorado. It has a foundation of 12 layers of precious stones. It has streets of gold and it has 12 gates that the doors on them are a giant pearl. And I can't even imagine how that functions, but I believe it to be true. Now, can you believe that the heaven where Jesus is right now is any less beautiful than the New Jerusalem's going to be? Think about this. He had a home like that. He had lived through eternity with his father. He had all the same attributes of the father. He had the adoration of the angels. He was the commander of the angels. So he had power, he had authority, he had anything he wanted. And yet, what was he willing to do? He was willing not only to set it aside for a time, but his omnipresence he set aside for eternity. Why would anyone give that up and come down here and be born into poverty in a little bitty, bitty village over in Palestine? There's only one answer for that. Love. His love for you. His love for me. Charles Dickens wrote a novel called A Tale of Two Cities. Now this took place in London, England and Paris, France and it was right around the French Revolution. And at the time they were taking all the nobles and all the powerful people, taking them off and taking them to the guillotine. Now the story of the book is pretty involved so we're not going to look at that, we're just going to cut to the end of the story. This man named Carton, his best friend in the world was a man named Darnay. And he found out that Darnay had been put in prison and was going to lose his head. And Carton loved Darnay and he also loved Darnay's family. And he found out that Lucy, Darnay's wife, and their child, there was a plot against them to give them the same treatment. So Carton goes over and he works with a spy in the prison and he manages to get in to the prison to visit Darnay. Now one thing about Carton and Darnay is they shared a resemblance. They say it was a remarkable resemblance. So when Carton gets into the prison, he drugs Darnay changes clothes with him and they get Darnay out and he has made arrangements for Darnay, his wife and daughter to go to England. Knowing that he has saved their lives gives him the courage to die at the guillotine. Now why do I bring this up? Look at Romans 5 verse 7. Romans 5 verse 7. Romans 5 verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. And that's where this story fits in, isn't it? For the right person you might give your life under the right circumstances. But look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Carton was willing to die for what he considered a good family. But Jesus was willing to die for any and all of us, even those who don't really want any part of him. 
he paid a debt that he did not owe because we owe a debt that we cannot pay. Finally, that last example I brought up, those who don't think it's necessary because we are saved by grace. Turn to Matthew 22 with me. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verses 36. The lawyer says to him, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt, what? <coughs> Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt, Love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, you cannot love God and break any of the commandments on the first table of stone. And you can't love your fellow man and break any of the commandments on the second table of stone. How many of us break those commandments daily? Have you ever thought about that? How many of us really love the other person in here so much that we'd put them first? How many times do we have quarrels with somebody over something that's insignificant? I've seen families split over things that weren't that important, especially when it comes to money. But Jesus handles things differently. Look at John 14. John 14. Verse 15 says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Now, can those commandments be kept? Would he ask us to do anything that he, we couldn't do? No, his biddings are enablings. Look at the next chapter, John 15. John 15, verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Two verses on, John 15, 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another as what? I have loved you. Is there anything he wouldn't do for you? Absolutely not. Verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Do you love him? Do you love him? Now, I've heard people discount these scriptures because they're in the Gospels and that happened before the cross. But the, all that doesn't hold true. Look at 1 John. Let's go to the epistles of John. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. May I suggest to you this morning that God does expect something of us. We've come full circle. We saw at the very beginning in Eden he expected something out of Adam and Eve. He expected something out of his chosen people, Israel. And he expects something of us now. But the difference is love. Do you love him? Do you see the things he's offering? Do you see the things he has given up for your salvation?
All these things can be done through the power of His Holy Spirit. My question for you this morning, does this inexplicable love that He has shown us elicit a response from us? Can someone give their life for you and not have it change your life? But he still asks that same question that Gold asked Tevye. Do you love me? Before we have the closing hymn, I'd like you to bow your heads with me. I'd like to make a call but so often when we make calls, we ask people to stand. And then the whole congregation winds up standing because the person or persons around them are standing. I would like to know if his love is something you want, that you would just raise your hand. If you believe in that love and the changes it's going to make in your life, Put that hand up there. Let him know. Let the angel see what you want to do. Will you make a commitment to spending more time with him from this day forward so that you can love him more than anyone or anything in this life? Just raise that hand to him. Lord, you see the hands. Empower your servants, dear Lord. Empower us to follow you wherever you want to lead us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.